but let me start by sharing the story. All right, um, everyone able to see the screen? Yes, so all right. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, thanks, Brian. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Adelaide.net user group. My, uh, my name is Param. I'm a software architect in Sydney, and I've been in um, software development, system design, and application uh, architecture space for uh, about 20 years now. Uh, today, we are going to discuss about um, how can we do uh, our application development in today's world of distributed systems and microservices better and faster. We also have a short working demo uh, towards the end of the presentation. And all of the artifacts that is shown here, including this presentation, is available in GitHub, which I'll share the link later. In today's application development in, in enterprise space, is very different from what, we, what customers used to expect um, 20 years ago. Today, we are expected to build um, uh, high performance, low latency, scalable applications in a cost effective manner, even for simple use cases to keep up with the market demands. Hence, uh, distributed applications and microservices is becoming a norm these days for which uh, for the uh, uh, promises is delivered in terms of benefits such as scalability, resiliency, and overall flexibility. There's, all, there's also an increasing uh, a trend towards cloud and uh, serverless platforms as uh, developers like to focus more on developing applications for the business requirements than focusing on uh, provisioning and maintaining the infrastructure components. Today's developers also use a variety of third-party services, tools, frameworks, and uh, languages that sp target specific business requirements. We no longer use a single language or framework for uh, everything in our applications. In this climate of enterprise application development, where speed of development and uh, the time to market is critical, what is stopping us from gaining the speed without losing or compromising the flexibility in terms, in terms of scale and features? If you look at from an evolutionary um, viewpoint, uh, microservices are a relatively new approach in building uh, large scale applications, and hence we see limited uh, tools and runtimes that support this paradigm. The question is how cool would it be to develop applications in a runtime that inherently understands the nature of distributed system? The runtime that understands your application, which is going to be ha uh, having granular chunks of application logic developed by different teams uh, in different languages and running in an unreliable infrastructure and network, yet magically they should function cohesively and to deliver your business requirements. So let's see how this is um, done with an example. So take an uh, example of a typical e-commerce application today. You're going to have a set of services um, or applications that will seamlessly work together to deliver a checkout experience. So you might have a front end app. Let's say you have a web application written in the JavaScript frameworks like um, Angular or React for client-side rendering, or say maybe Node.js or ASP.NET for server-side rendering. This front end application might talk to a backend system, which might be decomposed into smaller uh, discrete components, uh, each taking up specific business responsibilities. Say, for example, a shopping cart service deals with managing your shopping cart while you shop through uh, the um, site. The, the payment service deals with the financial transaction of your order. Your inventory service keeps track of your products and the stock level and so on. So each service that you see here may choose to design their own uh, functional domain independently and persist the data in a different storage solutions depending on their use case. Yet these services has to communicate uh, with each other seamlessly, in most cases asynchronously, for the performance benefits, um, to deliver your uh, business requirement, in this case, the checkout experience. These services may choose to employ different middleware solutions, 
uh, running in different environments, say on on-premise or cloud, depending on your situation, for for them to communicate between each other. Further, these uh, services may use external resources um, for for their function, or may need to react to external events. For example, the email service may use uh, services like Twilio or Amazon SES for sending all kinds of emails from the system. You may also want to choose one vendor over the other uh, for any number of reasons at different point of time. So with this flexibility comes the complexity. You have the complexity in, uh, in development and, and testing, complexity in deployment and maintenance, especially uh, with respect to your cross-cutting functionalities, like um, how does how do you do secure uh, communication between services? Or how do you do um, uh, different storage solutions and patterns? Or how do you do monitoring and uh, traces and logs? Which every service in the system is going. So the question is, wouldn't it be cool if we can off offload all these cross-cutting functionalities to your runtime, which, which inherently understands the nature of the distributed system, our microservices, so that you can focus on uh, developing your functional requirements and let the um, runtime handle the non-functional requirements. Introducing distributed application runtime, or for short, Dapper. Dapper, as the name implies, is a distributed system aware portable runtime, which you can build services or applications on top of that, which helps in building your microservices application faster. As a new entrant, modern runtime, Dapper sets itself pretty high standards as it, as it goes. Goals such as being language neutral, adapting um, industry standards such as open API, being portable so that you can run anywhere, be it a cloud or on-premise, and even better, bring all these features as swappable plugins so that you can incrementally start adapting Dapper in your projects today rather than committing to a particular framework um, up front, and most most of the time you regret later if it doesn't work for you. So let's see how um, this is done. So Dapper achieves a language agnostic by exposing its features um, through well-defined uh, HTTP and gRPC APIs. This means virtually any language um, that can do HTTP or gRPC calls can start using Dapper, it doesn't matter be it on a, a Java or a .NET or Python, if you can do HTTP or gRPC calls, you can consume Dapper. So Dapper offers these discrete uh, uh, features as discrete building blocks. These building blocks are nothing but your, if you look at closely, are cross-cutting functionalities that every microservices in your, in your system is going to need. Things such as secure communication between your services using direct invocation or through events, persisting and managing the state of the uh, application, accessing an external resource or responding to an external event. Moreover, uh, the, the framework is flexible and extensible to any third party uh, uh, proprietary um, uh, functions, which means you can develop and add your own custom building block that that you need uh, if you if you if you feel there is a miss in uh, in the framework. So Dapper also runs on any uh, hosting infrastructure, whether you're running it on a bare metal a machine, a VM, a container, or a container orchestrator like Kubernetes. Indeed, Dapper has much tighter integration. Um, with Kubernetes as it was born out of uh, this microservices world. This means you can change your hosting infrastructure which are, without changing your application code. The Dapper employs a well-known integration pattern called a sidecar pattern. In this pattern, your sidecar application resides alongside your main application and shares resources such as CPU, memory, disk, and um, network. Here, the sidecar application is your Dapper runtime, exposing its functions as HTTP and gRPC endpoints. So if you want to invoke a, a service or publish an event, all you have to do 
is to send HTTP or gRPC request to your Dapper sidecar over localhost, which is pretty reliable as data over localhost never leaves your network stack in, in your underlying system. So not only invoking your service from uh, your from your service or publishing events, any Dapper enabled service can use all built-in or custom functions provided by Dapper in this manner. And we'll, we'll go through one by one in detail. These functions or features are implemented as components and they support multiple uh, underlying providers. There are over 70 components available and everything is done in open over GitHub. You can check out the links here. So let's start describing the key building blocks of Dapper and go in bit detail for each one of them. Service to service invocation allows you to perform RPC style and method calls securely. State management building blocks offers persistent storage functions for your services. Publish and subscribe building block provides endpoint to publish and subscribe uh, for events between services. Input and output bindings provide APIs for accessing either external resources or react to an external event. Actors support actor model concurrency as opposed to thread-based concurrency and also uh, provides a state storage. Observability building block um, supports monitoring metrics and your traces across the system. Secrets building block offers management of confidential data for your services. Let's start one by one and uh, go in detail how it is done. First off, service invocation. Let's say you have an app or a service that that you want to invoke a method on an on another service called service A. You want to invoke a method called new order on service A. All you do is issue an HTTP request to your Dapper sidecar mm -hmm. over localhost, and the Dapper will take care of discovering this and delivering your request to service A over secure channel. Dapper by default uses mutual TLS with internal self-signed certificate for secure communication and multicast DNS for service discovery, which you can obviously switch to any other enterprise products like HashiCorp console. This HTTP pipeline to your service can further be extended by using Dapper middleware components, which can perform functions like authentication, authorization, or rate limiting before the request even hits your application. Here are the list of uh, built-in um, Dapper middleware you can build your customer components and add it to your HTTP pipeline across your services. Next up, state management. Dapper supports multiple states um, storage products. Let's say you, for example, you are using a Redis for storing your service data. You issue an uh, HTTP POST request to your Dapper sidecar if you want to write the data into Redis and that Dapper will take care of the rest. If you want to read data from Redis, you issue an HTTP GET to your Dapper sidecar, and the Dapper uh, sidecar will take care of the integration. Let's say you have developed your application on on-premise and used Dapper for your storage. Now you wanted to move your application uh, to the cloud. You want to switch uh, Redis to, say, uh, uh, Azure Cosmos DB for storage. All you need to do here is to change your service storage configuration on your Dapper sidecar and your application's code stays intact. Let's see how this is done. Here's a list of um, uh, storage API endpoints as exposed by uh, a Dapper sidecar. 
and on the right is the storage component configuration for Redis. So configuration for all Dapper components is done declaratively via ML files. Note here, the type specifies Redis and its parameters in the metadata section. Now, if you want to switch Redis to um, Cosmos DB, all you do is change your type and its corresponding parameters in YAML files and redeploy. Note that HTTP endpoints that you used by your application does not change. Similarly, for publish and subscribe messaging pattern, by now you might have realized there's a pattern emerging here. In this case, if your application wants to uh, publish an event, all you do is issue an uh, HTTP request to your Dapper sidecar, and the Dapper sidecar will take care of discovering and delivering your event to all the subscribers as HTTP request as well. And again, as you can predict, the underlying uh, message broker can be configured using uh, YAML files for Dapper. And you can see here is a list of API endpoints. To publish a message, you send an uh, HTTP post to your Dapper sidecar. To subscribe, you send a HTTP GET. And your messages are delivered as HTTP post to your application by the sidecar. The next stop is input triggers, which is also called input binding. This allows your service to react to an external event. For example, if you want to process tweets from a particular account, you can configure Twitter components for Dapper, and the Dapper will deliver the tweets as HTTP request to your application. You don't need to do your application doesn't need to do all um, the all the integration code by yourself. On the contrary, yeah. you can configure Dapper components as output bindings as well. For example, if you want to send and send emails from your service, let's say using Twilio, you can configure Twilio Dapper component and issue an uh, HTTP request to your sidecar, and the Dapper will take care of the integration. So here's a list of um, APIs exposed for input and output binding. And on the right hand side is the sample configuration for uh, Twitter integration. Next up is secret management. Any application today has some sort of confidential data that it deals with. Either it is user generated or system provider for its internal use. Some of the commonly used sensitive data includes API keys and tokens that you use to authenticate your application to an external service provider. For example, if you want to send emails using Twilio, you register a subscription, you obtain a, a API key for, the, um, for Twilio and use that API key um, in Twilio's SDK for sending your emails. In general, managing confidential data is a lot harder. You might have multiple rules and policies around the sensitive data and handling of sensitive data, depending on the industry you're working. So that is this general notion that regular business applications are not really good in managing sensitive data as developers tend to focus on business requirements rather than focusing on this managing uh, the sensitive data. Hence, we can offload this uh, overhead uh, to a secret management solution such as HashiCorp Vault, which is specifically tailored for this use case. Dapper can integrate with the such um, secret management solution and hide its complexity for, say, obtaining secrets by your application. So all your application needs to do is to send a HTTP GET request to read secrets from your underlying secret provider. 
So here is a list of endpoints for retrieving secrets and the, and the YAML configuration for what? As of today, Dapper exposes read-only endpoints for secrets as writing into a secret management uh, solution might be much more involved, complicated, and um, bespoke to a particular product used. Vault might have different uh, uh, requirements for writing uh, secrets into its store than other products, and it might have its own feature sets. So far, your microservices has been stateless. So what if, if you are using stateful microservices? Dapper provides a virtual active framework for developing stateful microservices. For those who do not know, active model is a viable alternative to thread-based concurrency, which we have been using by default in our applications. In thread-based concurrency, you employ various thread synchronization mechanism, such as locks, mutex, and semaphores, and thread synchronization is hard, especially during heavy loads. Actor model overcomes this thread synchronization issues by employing syndic threaded execution model. So your code modeled as actors are executed in a single threaded fashion and can have its storage returned to disk without locks, and that by increasing the performance. So I won't go too much in detail into actor model as in itself is a vast topic on its own. So as with everything with the dapper, you interact with actors by using HTTP request to your dapper sidecar. And dapper will take care of routing your request to the intended actor. So Actor by definition can roam around between host. And actors can be spawned by the actor runtime. Usually you don't new up your actor manually in your application code. So here is a list of endpoints exposed by Dapper sidecar for various actor functionalities. For example, if you want to invoke an actor, you send an HTTP post request to the Dapper sidecar and the Dapper sidecar will invoke your actor via HTTP put request. You can also instruct the actor runtime to save the state of the actor by issuing an HTTP put request to the Dapper sidecar. Monitoring your application health is critical, especially when, you're, when you have a lot of moving parts that must work together for your particular use case, in this case, microservices. Monitoring along with application events, logs and trace, traces, form the core of um, application observability pattern. Being deployed as a sidecar, the Dapper is best placed to understand the inter-service communication, map out the application landscape with uh, events, logs, and traces that can be, that that's produced in open telemetry industry standard. So that you can use standard tools like Datadog, Zipkin, or Eager to collect these application telemetry data. Especially for tracing, a dapper can help you to generate a live service call map automatically by any distributed system a distributed tracing solution like um, Zipkit from the data that is emitted by the sidecar. This is a great tool for debugging purpose when you're trying to map up, map out all the calls for a single request that goes through your uh, microservices, series of microservices. This not only, uh, these tools not only give, um, uh, give you connectivity information, but also latency information so that you can quickly find out which one of the services is the slowest one or having trouble? In being psychology, Dapper is best place to understand the metrics around inter-service communication, such as latency, error rate, and re resource utilization of one particular service.
that was supposed to be the first mode, which will use those lab parameters or a VM. Or in this mode, you initialize Dapper using Dapper init command, which downloads and runs all the internal components of Dapper as Docker containers. Once initialized, you can ask Dapper to start your sidecar on your local interface using your Dapper run command. Alternatively, a much easier and the preferred hosting model is on Kubernetes. You initialize Dapper using dap, Dapper in, in it a dash k command, which runs your Dapper control plane containing your things like dashboard, placement, operator, and injector ports on your little Dapper uh, memory. Dapper will try to run it for you if you run it, uh, the Kubernetes ports appropriately. We'll use a Kubernetes hosting mode for the demo because that's much simpler and uh, straightforward. In the self-hosted mode, is a little more involved in terms of deployment and initialization. Once it is initialized and deployed correctly, there's no difference between your uh, 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 self-hosted mode and uh, uh, in Kubernetes. You need to manually launch your application and your, uh, your Dapper sidecar, as there's no orchestrator to do it for you. Once you have launched this correctly, there's pretty much no difference in the, uh, the features. A single uh, Dapper container will pack all your components and will run it under your local network interface. Hence, you can port this setup anywhere, whether it's a local dev machine or a VM or in the cloud. As I said earlier, Dapper in Kubernetes environment is much easier, much more seamless, as you don't have to launch your Dapper sidecar manually. All you do is add your pod annotations, and Kubernetes will take care of the rest. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, you may realize this is done using Kubernetes custom resource definition and controllers. As soon as Kubernetes controller sees a particular pod that has been annotated with, uh, with Dapper annotations, it will start a, a Dapper runtime as a, a container within the pod. So finally, before we head to the demo, I would like to have a quick Another class of frameworks that might be under the service meshes. So, as you may realize, service mesh and Dapper might have quite a number of features in common, like mutual TLS, metrics collection, and distributed tracing. But service mesh tends to approach your microservices development from a network standpoint. Hence, it provides features like uh, traffic routing, traffic splitting network level access control between your services. Dapper, on the other hand, tends to approach microservices from a development standpoint. I would say they have they have they are complementary to each other and they can work alongside. And definitely one is not replacing the other. They each of them have their own place with their specific use cases. Probably you can choose which one of the features um, on which side you wanted to use. For example, if if you have both a service mesh like Istio and also Dapper, you can choose which uh, which uh, one you need to offload, say, for example, an MTLS2. But definitely these two can co coexist with each other and they have their own place and they approach microservices from a different angle. All right, now I'll go to Jason for a, a quick demo, which is implemented in .NET. All right. Um, do we have the slide of the environment? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, the last slide, I think. Yeah, okay. So what we're going to show today is um, a simple kind of hello world proof of concept of a whole bunch of these features. Um, you know, what we're going to have is a front end service, a back end service. And we're going to have it configured to use Redis for states for storage and RabbitMQ for messages. And do mess invocation between the front end and the back end. I'll share my screen. Okay. Okay, so first thing I wanted to sh just point out was we do have that on, on Git, the whole thing. Um, you can see we've covered a bunch of features, even self-hosted for debugging locally and, and on Kubernetes. And the demo today will be Docker running in Kubernetes mode. So that's something that you can just install on your local machine. Get started. The one step I've done already is install Dapper. So the, here's an example of, of just telling Kubernetes to run Dapper. Again, it's a runtime, so it runs with a bunch of services that it brings um, into, into that environment. And once you've done that, a bit of visibility that it provides out of the box is a dashboard, like the Dapper dashboard. So we have a little um, script to start that up. Again, we've got a bunch of helper scripts I'll go over. So this is what you see out of the box, telling you we've got a healthy control plane. These are the services that it's deployed, the dashboard itself, there's a placement server for if you're using actors. Um, the side card injector, which which will show us is part of you know the magic of making Dapper work, is each of your services will get a side card that you're communicating to, and and it does the work of all the communication in between. I have no components installed yet, and so we'll we'll get that going. The what we're going to deploy, bring it here, is well. First of all, I'll show you. We've got the scripts for that first in uh, setup that I showed. Uh, we're going to run an install, which is going to deploy all this um, that I'm going to show, and we have ones to help you with debugging. The front end service is is kept simple on purpose. This controller here has a function uh, that we expose the series. If you do a get on that, we're going to do a bunch of Fibonacci numbers. And what what's going to happen is we're going to invoke the backend service and post those Fibonacci numbers. And it's important to point out that we're using one of Dapper's many different SDKs to invoke this. So when you are using Dapper and you're bringing in your dependencies, you're only you're only bringing in the Dapper dependencies. And this is important. And one of the benefits of Dapper architecturally um, is that you're not pulling in cloud SDKs. You're not pulling in um, Redis, um, you know, NuGet packages and, and all that, that's kept completely out of the application. Um, so it's kept qu quite clean. And if you don't want even these, or if you are using a language that you know doesn't have a SDK, which there they could be a few obscure ones, you can just do a HTTP pet post or get, like Prem was saying. So for convenience, we're using that. That's invoke method. We're doing a post to a service called backend. The important thing about that is this this microservice knows nothing about 
who backend is or where they are, just there's a service called backend that exists. It's Dapper that does all the routing to get that one service communicating with the other, pulling its input method, and, and so it's completely abstracted. You're not, for example, on startup passing in a bunch of parameters into your service to help it find things. Once, once we've, we've injected those, um, we're going to inject in 10. Then what we're going to do is calculate um the get the count back the sum the mean the standard deviation variance and return that as a result to the console so we're going to do a little bit of statistics on top of the fibonacci numbers as our hello world um what I'll, the deployment has a bit of pauses in it so what i'll do is i'll i'll chuck it in now get it started now uh, install. Um, yeah. So what that's going to do is start deploying the services and the extra components that we want uh, Dapper to look after, which is we want it to integrate with Redis and RabbitMQ and Zipkin, and we're going to be using a bunch of this middleware configuration and, and all of this stuff and we're deploying our back-end front-end and security services and because i've got a bunch of pauses in there i'll just chuck it on now while we're talking about the back-end piece the back-end is also kept extremely lightweight that's the home controller there and what we're telling it again we're going to be referring to middleware and cache cache again the this component knows nothing about Reddit, uh, Redis or RabbitMQ, or any other of those pluggable services that Paran went over for security or anything. It's, it keeps your application very clean, the microservice is very clean. And what we're going to do is it's going to call those different backend pieces, like sum. You can see what it's doing is it's saying, Dapper, can you get me the state of the database? And so this is um, getting data out of uh, Redis in this case, but it, it could have been Cosmos DB in, by just configuration. Uh, getting the count. Uh, we save state via the input come up um, route. So saving to the database. And yeah, a bunch of those like that. We also have a reset if we want to clear it for later tests. If you wanted to hook into the message bus, then there's a convenience method, which is you can subscribe to topics. So if you've played around with RabbitMQ, you'll know that's very nice to have this simple way of subscribing to a topic in a message bus and retrieving. And, and in this case, it lets you know whenever that returns. Again, it's a lot of abstraction that they've provided. Now let's see if how that deployment's going. Yeah, OK, it's done. So this part is the configuring of Dapper itself and saying that we want a bunch of components. Again, like uh, Pram alluded to, you can pick and choose which parts of Dapper you want to include. So if you wanted to throttle, make sure your API wasn't being called out of control, but you wanted to kind of rate limit it, there's component for that. And, um, you know, the cache piece and, and all that. And then our microservices, I showed you the back end, front end. Uh, there's a security piece as well to integrate with OAuth. <clears throat> the pods, that, the pods that, that you know that it did create those pods on your behalf, and it's going to inject side carts into those. Here's your services and the, the deployments, et cetera. Um, and now in order to demo this, there's a bunch of ports that we're going to expose. First of all, we're going to want the the um, back end. Actually, I should show you the scripts here. So we have a bunch of scripts that, you know, because you want to play with this yourself, get, kick the tires. There they are. And if we want to port forward back end, we're just mapping it to our local um system here 
front end, exposing those. That security one. Now, oh, yep. And we will demonstrate uh, the Zipkin integration. Now, Prem mentioned there's open tracing, like built in the telemetry. So we'll show a little bit of that. Um, I'll go back to that dashboard. Because now you can see that let's pick those up and our services. Um, and again, it's about the visibility that I provide you. So all of your services that Dapper has discovered and it's kind it's working on your behalf to instrument and, and do the discovery are, are, are demonstrated here along with the ports that they have, the configuration that's been provided for them. Um, it gives you the full the full scripts and 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 all that. The you can even get the logs. Um, Dapper will expose the logs its own logs to talk about its own placement service and things like that, but it'll also expose your components logs. I'm not sure if there is on the on this back end one, but the components themselves, like when we're talking about the Redis cache and things like that, that's that configuration for the Redis cache kept completely out of your code. So if you had secrets or passwords you wanted to put there, um, you, um, well, you, first of all, you'd use the secret store instead, but these things are kept completely out of your code. Um, in the demo, of course, we have it all checked into source control. Um, you can see that they're located here under components. So the configuration for Redis is here. Um, we did add some middleware for the RabbitMQ and for um, secrets. It's just using the Kubernetes secret store, but um, you, you can choose your own. And the cache, again, that's that Redis state store, is all there. So that's how that came about. If I go and just do the simple end-to-end -end call, so all, all we're doing is we're just doing a curl at, on series. So let me um, clear the screen a little bit. We're going to call that series. He's going to create those Fibonacci sequences and then ask back a bunch of stats. So there's the stats, as simple as that. Um, that's the end-to-end -end pass through. And for um, Zipkin, wait, I didn't need to have that start already. Let's bring that up again. OK, so that's going to be on 9411. I'll bring up local host. Then it's going to give you the, the built in tracing um, and dependency discovery and and things like that. So. It discovered, you know, front end is calling back end. And I think. Yeah. And here's here's the calls. So the front end calling the back end and the times. If you wanted to add more tracing, there is a header you need to set inside the code to do that. But what this demonstration this demonstration has shown you is with a little bit of getting started, you can take your application, have Message pub sub, have abstraction of the data store, and have message passing between your microservices all handled for you. And have that completely, that whole configuration taken out of your application and, and put in the hands of the DevOps team and all source controlled. And bring an extra level of visibility into your microservices than you've ever had before. 
Um, uh, last thing I'll mention is that they do have a good community. Um, so here, the, here is their Discord, and you can see it's very active. Even at the moment, right now online, there's over 300 people answering questions. So, you know, giving feedback and answering questions all the time. It's been great. We got stuck on a few things when we we're building this proof of concept, and and we got help. They also do a community call. I, I can't remember if it's fortnightly. Where, where you can see what's new and also do demos and, and raise questions. And they're going to move to an RFC kind of model in the future where you can propose development and working groups. Yeah. All right. Um, that's the demo. Should we open it up to questions? Sounds good. If uh, anyone's got a question, uh, feel free to post in the chat or if you want to come off mute uh, and ask a question, feel free to do that too. Uh, one cool thing I like to point out. Um, is the actor model stuff is tested against 1 million actors before they release. So you can get very good scalability on that side. And a little bit of history is it was Mark Rasinovich working internally who kicked off the Dapper project. So while he's not listed as a contributor per se, he was the one who sat down and said, how would we help people who are building microservices, you know, abstract away all the requirements that for running them on-prem, in the cloud, in AWS, in Azure, and just make it a better experience overall. And so he was kind of that vision, the visionary kicked it off. All right, I think. I guess we're good on the question front. Yep, same, so pretty quiet. Um, yeah, no, thanks, guys. That, that was a really interesting talk. Um, I, I hope that's useful to people. Um, certainly, microservices seems to be. Uh, where where things are at um, for for a lot of new development now. So anything that can make managing those easier is, is a good thing. Um, I'd, yeah, I'd be curious as to maybe just a bit of a hands up uh, with the reactions in teams. Like, are, are people working with microservices now? Like, um, would are they have they tried to use Dapper already, or are they looking at using something like Dapper? Um, just uh, curious where people are at already so yeah hands up if, if this is something that you would consider using or, or are interested in kicking the tires um, in the near future we well, just thought it sounded interesting and wanted to come along and learn a bit more about it okay um got some people in the chat um with some a range of experiences okay question from simon there um how would you sort of link in a database with dapper yeah, for him, you wanna, server. you're gonna mention that like we, we did demo um redis because Really, Dapper um, expects more of a key value pair database rather than the full on, you know, entity framework kind of relational model for that. And, you know, you're not you're not going to be plug and play swapping the databases as. But a, 
Key value pair, sure. Yeah, this is again a nascent um, technology. Um, uh, you can see a few um, uh, gaps um, like um, SQL Server or uh, reading um, or writing uh, things into um, a secret management solution. So where they have tried to do the the best uh, um, uh, best abstraction at first as a first round, and then probably uh, they might think into uh, bringing um, other involved products uh, as abstractions. Yeah, definitely uh, getting connection strings from uh, uh, things like that can be offloaded and uh, um, probably we think uh, that's the one, uh, one, one reason that they have uh, stopped at um, read level and not gone into write because um, um, probably we will uh, we'll use read more in terms of uh, secret management. Yeah, I can I can mention that even though we've got this demo as a very um, general proof of concept, in, internally we did took an existing kind of Docker Swarm application and and started converting it, going down this path, converting it to Dapper, and that's where straight away connection strings into Secret Store. It you know it works, it works well. It takes that out of your application. And there is a Dapper um, ASP.NET, I guess you would say it's a NuGet extension, which can, connects into configuration. So ASP.NET configuration, and you, you can, it'll, it'll do all the work of talking to Dapper and, and it'll populate your configuration for you with the connection string, for example. Um, yeah, so that was very smooth. A question about, um, have you ever used Qvela? I haven't, Prem. No, we haven't. This seems to be more of a uh, um, CI/CD pipeline tool for uh, for Kubernetes. Definitely worth, might be worth checking out. Yeah, it's used on DevOps side and uh, in some Dapper presentations on the internet, it's presented as a perfect uh, a match. Okay, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So it's to a comment there from from Ben Schultz about uh, it. It sounds a bit like a uh, if this in that IFTT. Yeah, I think I have to. Um, probably. Um, uh, yeah, probably. You you can say that it's uh, more for, uh, as an IFTT for developers, um, abstracting away uh, um, components rather than services um, as applets. Here they call components. IFTT calls applets. So yeah, probably you're right. Yeah, and also the the way the bindings work, the triggers and and that kind of thing. It it allows that really easy integration to services and and triggering your code from those services. And also, if you were interested in in trying to do a function as a service type of platform, you could potentially just use those triggers to trigger your your little like a webhook kind of thing and build that out. So that's also an option. Cool. All right, well, it seems to be uh, some, some interesting comments and questions there from folks, but uh, we might wrap it up there. That seems a good place to, to finish up. Thanks. Thanks, Jasim and uh, Aram. Really appreciate you giving up your evening to, to join us and uh, some, some really good content there. So uh, thanks once again and thanks everyone else for for joining us uh, this evening or this morning or wherever you are. I think we have had some people from the other side of the world, which is exciting and a nice advantage of doing stuff online that that can happen. Um, but yeah, so we'll be back again uh, next month and 
yeah, thanks everyone and wish you a, a good evening, good day or good afternoon and uh, catch you again next time. Bye. Thank you.